Good morning, friends. Welcome to Elizabeth Sharon Ann Bible Study. And on September 1st, it is officially Dream Big Today. My name's Debbie, and this is August 23rd. If you've been reading with us throughout this whole time, this would be day 235 that you have read through the Bibles. And man, we've we've just we've got a little over a hundred year or hundred years, hundred days left. And if I was really quick on math this morning, I'd tell you exactly how many that is, but that's not happening. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still on my coffee trying to get charged up for the day. Um, put your put your prayer request in the chat box and your praise reports. I know so many of you have experienced miracles this last week and maybe yesterday. Put that in there so we can rejoice with you and just, you know, it's it we'd like to shout out to Jesus and just praise him for everything that he's done and is doing and will do. And there's so many things yet to come. So today I again I've got to start out with my devotion. My devotion, I mean, it just hits poor old Job. And we'll be into Job eight through 11 this morning and man we'll recap that just a little bit but I want to I want to read this to you because I feel like that it's it touches me and I feel like that it'll touch you too merciful Jesus I ask you to smooth out the tangled up places in my life including those in my heart and mind have you ever thought about that do you feel, you know, I've never heard it called the tangled up places in my life. And I, and I really kind of like that because I don't, I don't feel like you know, I've, I've experienced any depression or, or any major issues, but sometimes there's just some of that little snippet of something that just kind of can eat at you, right? I come to you just as I am with all of my naughty problems, and that's K-N-O-T-T-Y. Many of my difficulties are complicated by other people's problems. Look at Job. Good morning, Lynn, Christy, Carrie. I see a whole bunch, and Karen, I see a whole bunch of friends on this morning. Man, I like to, to oh, and Angel. Good morning, Angel. Okay. Many of my difficulties are complicated by other people's problems. Why do we do that? Why do we get involved in stuff that's not even ours to our bag to carry? So it's hard to sort out how much of the mess is mine and how much is theirs. Because, you know, I'm a fixer. I'm a fixer. I'm a control person. And I really like to help you fix your problems. Because, see, I, I'll push mine back into the closet and shut the door. I, I'll come over and I'll help you. It's free. I want to take responsibility for my mistakes and sins without feeling responsible for the sinful failures of others. Please help me untangle my complex circumstances and find the best way forward. I'm realizing that Christian growth is all about transformation, a lifelong process. So if you're not where you think you ought to be, just know that you are, you are in a better place than you were. We are all a work in progress. Some of the knots of my past are hard to untie. I, I get that. Because see, sometimes we don't feel like they, that we are worthy of being forgiven of our past mistakes, our past failures, our bad choices, our sins. And we keep that bundled up and we keep that tied up. Especially if it involves people who hurt me. Instead of obsessing about how to fix things, I need to keep turning towards you, seeking your face, seek your face and your will. As I wait with you, help me to relax and trust in your timing. See, his timing is way better than what I expect. I've got a schedule out here, you know, and I'm retired. Why would I have a schedule? Well, for many reasons. If I don't have something written down, I might forget. Or I look to see <clears throat> what, what's the next thing I need to be doing for sure. 
Show me how to live with unresolved problems without letting them distract me. Because see, whenever you go to bed at night, are you rehearsing and rerunning throughout the whole day? And, and you're probably highlighting in your mind the problems rather than the blessings. I rejoice that your abiding presence is my portion and my boundless blessing. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, but we all with unveiled face beholding as a in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. What if Job would have had a devotion to read? What if he would have had somebody to speak life into him instead of his three buddies that came in and and are just really giving him a hard time now if you haven't been reading this with us for the last few days I say last few days I think it started Sunday and this is just Tuesday so a couple of days let I'm gonna kind of recap just a tad bit of what has happened um Job friends. Now, Satan first, I'll back on up even farther. Satan has been allowed to attack Job. He's lost his, his children. And there was a bunch of them. He's lost his, his livestock, his livelihood. His wife has been mad at him. He, she wanted him cursed God and die. What, a, what an encourager there. Poor Job starts out with his wife. And then here comes the friends and the friends just, I mean, man, if we only had friends that were so wise in their own eyes, what would that be like to give you encouragement? So they were only true encouragers for one week. They sat silent with him, just, just was there with him in presence. And really that's sometimes all we need. Um, but once they began to speak, they became Job's great discouragers. They responded, Job, they responded to Job's words, but they failed to see his pain or recognize his suffering. <clears throat> so it's a lesson for us as friends or flip it over if you're Job, how do you handle this? So let's think of the friend portion of this if you want to be a godly encourager we won't won't speak until we've truly listened it's why you have two ears and one mouth just think of that you need to be listening listening twice as much as you speak um we're supposed to direct everybody to god he's the true friend christian encouragement doesn't doesn't uh, involve, you know, hitting somebody, waking them up and, and just being, you know, rough with them. So we've got a place to help somebody that's going through a tough time. And we know people that's going through tough times. Remember this, here's some bullet points I want to, I want to share with you. When friends or loved ones are facing trouble, they don't need sarcasm. They need support. They don't need logic. They need love. They don't need experiences. They need encouragement because what do we do? We tend to go back and say, well, I did that once and this is how I got through it. This is how I happened. That can be good in a sense, but don't mention it. Don't speak of it if it's only going to elevate you on how good you are, if you do that, let it be a encouragement to them to see how God helped you through it. Now, they don't need assumptions. They need assurances. They don't need advice. Oh, maybe I need to read that to me again. Hang on. Let me step back and read this to me. Debbie, they don't need your advice. They need your affirmation. Okay, I got that. 
they don't need pious platitudes. They need powerful principles. So as comforters, we should be uh, compassionate, but we also need to be people of compassionate truth who avoid senseless platitudes. I don't know about you, but I thought, wow, wow, wow. This is really good for today. And as we, as we think that we want to encourage people, we want to jump in there and we want to just really tell them how, how they can get past that because I, and, and you know what, maybe, that you're, maybe you're not doing this with your friends, but what came to me this morning whenever I was rereading all of this is I've, I've done this with my kids because see, I, I know what they did last week or last month or last year. And I can, I can just come back and I can, I can play the whole story for them because you did this, 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 and this is where you are, is why this has happened to you today. Well, in some sense, maybe that's true, but why, why am I bringing up the past to talk to my children about their future? So in the, in the reading today, we're at this with the second guy, uh, and this is Bildad. And he is, he's, he listened to, uh, he listened to the other one, Eliphaz speak yesterday. Now Eliphaz was, uh, he was, he was pretty strong with him. Now here comes Bildad, the Shuite. And he's explaining to Joe that he's, you know, you got to admit that you've sinned. That's why you're still suffering, because you won't admit your sin. And his advice was like, how long are you going to do this? How long? How long are you going to act like this? Straighten up and act like you're supposed to. See, his source of wisdom was that he, it was inherited from the past. Trustworthy knowledge is second hand. He based his advice to Job on traditional proverbs and sayings that he frequently quoted. See if we got that really, really good catchy little phrase. We can throw that out there at every situation. And, and boy, we, we really sound good. So Job, Eight through chapter 11. How long will you go on like this? You sound like blustering wind. Oh man, what a, what a statement to somebody that, that is just down and out. Does God twist justice? Does the almighty twist what is right? Your children's sin. And their punishment was deserved. Why, sure, that because your kids die, that it's, it's, it's their fault. It's their fault. But if you pray and seek God, the favor of the Almighty, and if you're pure and you live within integrity, he will surely rise up and restore your happy home. Just ask the previous generation. Pay attention to the experience of our ancestors. We were born but yesterday and know nothing. So listen to this. We can learn from the past, but the past must be a rudder to guide us into the future, not an anchor to hold us back. The fact that something was said years ago doesn't guarantee it's right today because you know what? Somebody said, just uh, rub two sticks together and you'll have light. Well, you know what? I 10 times rather walk over and flip the switch on and turn it on. You know, I'm not a rub two sticks together type of girl. But past doesn't make, it, it's a learning. It's a, something to learn not to live in. And then verse 11, if you go through here, you're going to see all kinds of catchy things because they really have some good catchy things in here. But sometimes it's fun to dig into one of them. I dug into verse 11, Job 8, verse 11. Can papyrus 
reeds grow tall without a marsh? Can marsh grass flourish without water? I don't, you know, what if somebody asked me that, and whenever I'm, if I had something bad happen, I'd say, what's your point? Well, so he uses this, and this is what I found. And so it's kind of interesting. Um, the principle of cause and effect, because the water causes it to grow, causes the reeds to grow. It's a fragile growth that withers before any other plant. These reeds are like the hypocrite or the one who makes a mere show of faith without true trust in God. So like the reed, hypocrites grow up quickly. They are hollow without substance. They are easily bent. They can lower their head in false humility and they bear no fruit. Even as the papyrus quickly withers and dies, so will those who turn their back on God. He may prosper for a time, but will ultimately come to a ruin. Okay, so we get over to um, chapter nine, Job Speaks. And man, he says, I know all of this is true in principle, but how can a person be declared innocent in God's sight? Verse four, for God is so wise and so mighty, who has ever challenged him successfully? Look at verse eight. He alone has spread out the heavens and marches on the waves of the sea. See, Jesus walked on water. In verse nine, he made all the stars, the bear, Orion, and the Pleiades in the constellations of the southern sky. A star announced Jesus' birth. He does great things too marvelous to understand. He performs countless miracles. Jesus did uncountable miracles. There were so many that it, it could never even be recorded in anything. He says in verse 19, if it's a question of strength, he's the strong one. If it's a matter of justice, who dares summon him to court? Though I am innocent, my own mouth would pronounce me guilty. Though I am blameless, it would prove me wicked. Now, Job says he is guiltless. He's not complaining. He's not claiming to be sinless because there's only one sinless person. And of course, he hadn't met him yet. And then in verse, uh, this is in chapter nine, verse 33. If there was only a mere, if there was only a mediator between us, someone who could bring us together, the mediator could make God stop beating me. We have that mediator today. Jesus is the one that goes between us and, and God and pleads our case. The Holy Spirit is our advocate and he prays and he, and, and he is there to give us those nudges and, and be with us. Chapter 10, I'm disgusted with my life. Let me complain freely. See, he's going down a bad path right here. He says, I will say to God, don't simply condemn me. Just take me the charge you are and bring against me. See, he's still not, he's still not cursing God. He's, you know, just take me, take me and it'll be done. In 10 verse eight, you formed me with your hands. You made me. Yet now you completely destroy me. You made me from dust. Then in verse 16, and if I hold my head up high, you hunt me like a lion and display your awesome power against me. So in uh, James chapter five, 
verse 11, and I've got King James Version. It says, behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So the word translated patience, and I can't say it a Greek word, is better rendered endurance or perseverance rather than patience because Job does not appear patience, patient. But whenever you dig in and you find the the Greek word or, you know, whatever you're digging through, it's endurance. It indicates endurance in whatever trials we face without losing our faith in God. So how are you doing on that? See, Job is, he's, he's bitter, but he's certainly not got anybody lifting him up right now. He's discouraged. He, he doesn't know what to do. He loves God. He still, he's, he still has that reverent fear of God, but he doesn't know what to do. Then here comes a new friend, Zophar. And so his thing is wisdom belongs to the wise. He bases his advice on wisdom that had no other source than himself, his wisdom. And he replies, shouldn't someone answer this torrent of words? He's probably been about to bust sitting there thinking, man, it's my turn. I can't wait. I'm holding my hand up. Come on, guys. I've got something to say because I'm tired of this. He's really, he's really hard on him. Zophar harshly accused Job of self-righteousness in, in verses four through six. It says, you claim my beliefs are pure and I am clean in the sight of God. If, I, if God would only speak, only he would tell you what he thinks. If only he would tell you the secrets of wisdom. See, he accuses him of stubbornness in verses 13 through 20, telling him that he deserved to suffer even more than he had. He maintained that if Job would turn from sin, his sufferings would ease and security, prosperity, and happiness would return. But so far as speech contains a lot of theological error. The Bible doesn't speak of a life clearer than the noonday as he spoke in verse 17 your life will be brighter than the noonday even darkness will be as bright as the morning that's not that's not biblical for the faithful believer rather we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of god and that's acts 14 22 so chapter or verse 13 if only you would prepare your heart and lift up your hands to him in prayer. Get rid of your sins. Zophar was rough on him. And as you, as you read down through that, you'll, I mean, it's really, it's really interesting to see what pops out to you. How is this a lesson for us today to be encouragers of the faith? and to lift our, our friends and family up. Remember, lift your family up. The ones that's closest to you may be hurting the worst. And we tend to overlook them because we're, we're used to their mood swings. We're used to things like that. We know we told them what they should have done yesterday and they didn't do it. So you deserve what you get. Thank goodness God isn't that way. So let's jump on into 1 Corinthians 15. 1 through 28. And remember, Paul isn't there yet. He's not in Corinth yet. He's still writing this. And, and man, he must have had this big, long letter of questions and issues that he had to resolve. He says, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. Now, that we're talking about the gospel. The gospel means good news. And this news should have absolute preeminence and priority in the life of every Christian, the life of the church. He says, you welcomed it, the news that he brought, and you still stand firm in it, 
It is this good news that saves you if you will continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. So firmly or hold fast means there's some people or things that's trying to snatch away the gospel from the Corinthian Christians. Now, can you see that today? There's something that's trying to snatch away the good news from you receiving it. In verse three through four, he says, I passed on to you what was most important. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. Now circle that because in those two places, he told you where he got this. The scripture said. And that is important. He repeated it twice. It's important. Spurgeon said, we are not makers and inventors. We are repeaters. Our religion is not based on opinion, but on facts. This is what the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then the 12. And it goes on to say, then in verse eight, last of all, um, as, as though it was him, last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. And I thought, what in the world is he talking about? Born at the wrong time? Why, why is he saying that? Now, if I find the right note that I should have for that, I'm going to tell you, it was like um, everybody had, the other disciples had walked this journey with Jesus for the last three years. And Paul is right at the end of it. So he didn't have that full time of just, just soaking up the you know the time with jesus so he was he come along at the end of this journey oh there's my note yes so paul technically i guess you could say he was the next generation believer <clears throat> and so it says but whatever I am now, it's because God poured out his special favor on me and not without results. Now, you know, Paul was formerly Saul, a persecutor of Christians. And so he's, that's still, that's still probably just eaten on him that he, he used to promote killing them. In verse 11, it says, so it makes no difference whether I preach, they preach, we all preach for the same message you have already believed. And so 12, but tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there'll be no resurrection of the dead? For if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. So if there's no resurrection, there's no reason for us to have Bible study. There's every, everything that we've got. My, my four Bibles that I've got laying out here in front of me this morning are just a, just a book you can check out at the library. You can buy off of Amazon. It's just, you know, just worthless. But see, that's not the case because we know that he, he uh, was born of a virgin he he was born on this earth he was the son of god he did live a sinless life he died on the cross for your sins and he rose on the third day from the dead so all of this is what christianity is based on that's what our personal faith hedges on every bit of this so how, how do you feel about all of this? Do you believe, do you believe without a doubt that Christ 
rose from the dead and that he walked on earth. See, that would be, that would be something to, to continue dwelling on and meditating on and digging into your Bible. If you have any doubts, let those doubts be resolved today. Pray that the Holy Spirit would place in your, in your heart a desire to seek and study and pray to build that relationship with him because today's reading is, is huge. It's what it's all about. Verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then all of our preaching is useless. And your faith is useless. See, there's you sick. Well, you know, there's no reason to pray if you if you don't believe that he was raised from the dead. There's no reason to pray if if you're you've got some kind of uh, calamity going on in your life right now because who's going to answer that? You know, we we take so many things for granted, and I've said this before. Folks, I can't stay up all night long to make sure that my heart beats all night long and that I breathe in and out all night long. There's somebody greater than me that made me, that makes my, my internal organs continue to work when I'm sound asleep so I can rest, so I can, or even when I go take my afternoon power nap, my body is still working. I can't do that on my own. There's a greater, a, a creator that is greater than anything that we have. In verse 15, and we apostles would all be lying about God for we have said God raised Christ from the grave, but that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, then we are more pitied than anyone in the world. If all your hope is, is just so you can save up enough money to go put a down payment on a new house, that's your only goal. I'm, I feel sorry for you. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He's the first of a great harvest, some versions will say first fruits of all who've died. Just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. And so there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, the first fruits, then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. It says all, let's go, let's look on down here. In verse 24, after the end will come, then he will turn the kingdom over to God, the father having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles his enemies beneath his feet. I don't know about you, but that makes me excited. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So does this say everyone will be resurrected? Everyone? You know, see, I, I, is that a yes? Is that a no? Well, it's a yes and a no. All will be resurrected and receive a resurrected body and live forever. Now, here's the key. John 5, 29 says, those who have done good will get the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil will get the resurrection of condemnation. Now, in that verse, it says those who have done good. Now, does that mean that all good people will be in eternity forever in heaven? Well, Good doesn't mean that, that you're a believer because there's a lot of good people that don't believe in God. And they're not going to go to heaven just because they're good. You have, to, you have to believe that he was born on this earth, that he 
that he died on the cross for your sins and that he rose. Then when all things are under his authority, the son will put himself under God's authority so that God who gave his son authority over all things will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. What a precious, precious word for today. You know, we see, we see all of these friends of Job's and we're not done reading. We still have, we still have quite a bit to go. Uh, quite a bit of snippiness, if you want to call that, with the friends to Job. So we, we learn that they think they're being good. They, they feel like their wisdom is the best. Do you think that they feel like that they are they are on their way to their heavenly mansion and and Job is going straight to hell because apparently he sinned. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15 is is really a a great one to read and reread. Just just keep thinking about this. What do you believe today? What's your personal faith like? Psalms 38, 1 through 22 is a good one too. And it, it is, it is a, a sad one. Another one that's depressing. I mean, this is uh, David asking God to remember him. And I, and I jumped over to verse 11, Psalms 38, verse 11. And I thought about this, too, because of what our last two years have been like with the COVID, the shutdowns and everything like that. It says, my loved friends, my loved ones and friends stay away fearing my disease. Well, I've had COVID twice. You know, look, I'm, I'm still here. Even my own family stands at a distance. And, you know, there's been there's been uh, shutdowns that we've experienced it. I mean, we know that there's been a pandemic in the 1918, uh, whatever that was, the flu or whatever that, that took out a lot of people. Then we had the, this one. And so, you know, I heard a pastor talking about sheltering in grace when they tell you to shelter in place, I mean, that just makes you feel like this, this isolation and you can't even get out and it works okay for a few days. And, and it's kind of nice to just have peace and quiet and quiet and, and not have to worry about anything. But you know what, after, after weeks and months and you think, oh my goodness, I still have to shelter in place. But if you flip that around and think about how you can shelter in grace, what can you do during this time? If at this time in your life that you are still, you're experiencing something that you can't get out, just feel like you're sheltering in grace, that you're, you're under the wings of the creator and he's got you today. He's got you and he knows exactly how things are going for you. So today, pray that you believe wholeheartedly in the resurrection of Jesus. Pray that you 100% believe in your resurrection after death. If you have a saving faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're going to be there. We're all going to be rejoicing when we get there one of these days, hopefully sooner than later. Because you know what? Wouldn't it be nice just to be singing and praising with the angels and and just being with Jesus every day I mean I really want to see Job and and talk to him about everything that he'd gone through he's probably still going to be as upbeat as he was in just enjoying his relationship with God even though sometimes we have to be stretched a little bit to realize how our faith needs to grow if you're maybe maybe your faith needs to grow in one way that it hasn't before and it won't grow unless you're stretched just like your muscles don't get stronger unless if you work them out I haven't worked out my muscles in a long time and there and it, you know what my little grandson says Mimi you're squishy well yeah, yeah I'm kind of squishy and so <clears throat> I need to I need to work out 
my spiritual muscles, as well as my physical muscles, so I can be stronger in him. So come back tomorrow, and we're going to start Job 12. It continues. Let's learn something from that. And if you've got whatever your favorite thing was that you got today out of the reading, put that in the messages. I'd love to see your nuggets. I love you. And I'll be back tomorrow. See you then. Bye-bye.